And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have some a new a newcomer and a returning good brother to the temple. On one on one hand, from coming to us both coming to us straight from Dream Realm Storytellers, we have returning good brother Aiken. Hello. And making his debut here in my temple, one of the one of the other members of the Mo of the Motley crew over over at Dream Realm, SDV or Suet Denis Viral. I'm hoping it's I got a, that right. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you for coming on, and thank you for braving the hell of time zones because, I because there has to be an ocean that separates us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to make that gap shorter because I hate flying. Yeah, it's understandable. It's like not ten hours of flight, something like that, I guess. Well, to make it even worse. Airlines don't like tall people. <laughs> How I'm so? Just shy of two meters tall. Oh, okay. So being on that, being on that kind, being on that kind of box with low ceilings for ten hours, I'd rather avoid that if I can get away with it. Oh yeah, yeah, true. So I have to do. I have to do one of my humble, one of my traditions. Um. I've already done this with you, Aiken, so I'm, so I'm skipping that past that. But SDV, um, I'd like you to walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So I started to play role-playing games uh, when I started university. Uh, and uh, I went to a, a club, a, school, a club in the school, and uh, I just started playing and I couldn't stop. Uh, there were games uh, opening in the club, and uh, I think I uh, played, I had played uh, 14 games a week. Uh, so I, I rather study, uh, I rather play the games than studying, and uh, I drop out the school, and now I'm, <laughs> now uh, I'm playing the game, uh, and I'm, uh, uh, it's it's my work. It's my life, actually, currently. Mm -hmm. So, that brings me to Blood Punk, um, which is which, of course, is being split into two books: Heritage of the Dam and A Guide to Tolia. Um, I suppose the first place I can start is where did this particular idea come from of doing this Victorian Gothic meets well blood it blood as fuel kind of thing. Well, um, several years ago, I think we were in the uh, after the first uh, Corpus Malicious project. Mm -hmm. uh, we had this meeting with the team where we listed all the punks that we can think of. There were many things like biopunk, something punk, some sun punk, night punk, and blood punk was one of them. And it really got into our head the idea of blood punk. And then we kind of forget about it for a while. But then we did uh, Freya's Tears and the Corpus Collection, and it popped up again. Let's, we said, let us do something different. Mm -hmm. And hence the idea came out. It was just a name at the start. We, as the team, said, like, okay, cool, blood punk. There should be technology with blood, and that's all. But then the person who fleshed out the how that technology would work was actually Sedeve, STV. Uh, because when we were uh, when we were finishing the material for Corpus Collection, him and an, another friend of ours, Ape Emre, you can see him in the Meet the Team section as well, mm -hmm. they started in this uh, design process, two of them, and they came up with the, how the adventure should be going and how the technology should look like how should it work, etc. And being uh, having an affinity to engineering and physics, uh, STV had a easy time 
designing the stuff for that. Mm -hmm. So, I suppose, I suppose this is the first thing I should I should go I should go with is um. When it comes to the con when it comes to the concept of um, blood punk, would it be if you were if you were to give the elevator pitch to what to what that is to to someone or just or just to the people sitting at the table for the first time, how would you describe it? What? I'm not very really great at uh, elevator pitches, but uh, I would probably say the keywords. Blood, Crimson, Sanguine, and Vampires. Uh, we did that in our Kickstarter project mm -hmm. several times. Uh, I would say uh, that the power and the culture is uh, strongly uh, integrated with blood. And there are machinery and there are uh, sorcery and there are cultures that work on blood. Mm -hmm. uh, actually... The, Without uh, digging into the details, that's all I can say, I guess. Yeah. Well, I can say that uh, it is a new perspective to punk and to the Victorian era uh, punk settings. It is a new perspective to the system. Mm -hmm. uh, it has some uh, dark motives in it and some little touches of political motives, such as the system is draining your blood kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to reflect the gaps between the wealthy and the poor. Between We try to reflect the sacrifices you have to make or historically made in the name of production, in the name of uh, progress. Because, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, these sort of things actually happened, even though it was not blood-related. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I can say that. In a short paragraph, I guess. Yeah. Now, since you brought up since you brought up cyberpunk and and similar things, a lot of a lot of store a lot of stories within that particular area tend to fo tend to focus on these large labyrinthine I've e to the point that I've even called it akin to the lab the labyrinth of Greek myth. Um. And from what I from what I understand, there are two there are two mega cities within the within the realm of Tolia. Um, taking that into account, how when we're talking about mega cities, are we talking mega city one size big? Are we talking hive city style size big? How big are we talking when it comes to these cities? So uh, approximately, uh, there are million people living. Uh, in each city, uh, they are big. Uh, they are uh, as big as normal city, current normal cities. Mm -hmm. And I'm get I'm guessing the approach that you have with both of them is that it fe is that it feels like an endless labyrinth when you're in it. Yeah, uh, an endless labyrinth and a playground for urban urban encounters and. Every kind of thing that you can do in a city, in a fantasy realm. Yeah. Now, with the, the other thing that I that I am um, couldn't help but notice within the within that kind of city is that with when doing when doing urban style approaches, because of the fact that you can't do or at least you're very limited in how you can do a variety of a variety of monsters. Uh, most people will pivot towards um, factions in ter in terms of at, in terms of adversaries. Are you guys going in that sim in that similar route where there's a bu a bunch of factions, ga gangs, organizations, and the like that might like or dislike you? Well, there are factions, but uh, this is a Dungeons and Dragons game, so the adversaries will be uh, there's a variety. Of adversaries, and uh, they are not all vampires or mortals. There are uh, all kinds of them. Mm -hmm. uh, this might be an urban adventure, and the setting, but still, uh, it's a D and D game, and there will be still dragons, oozes, uh, undead, uh, magical creatures, beasts, and etc. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in that sense, we have two experiences. We historically had, uh, especially in Corpus Collection, we have these cities of, uh, city settings of Tolia, not Tolia, uh, Mindabar, uh, and Lonier. And our team kind of got used to and got experienced in uh, designing these cities and adding variety to them. So with that knowledge, I think we will be able to handle the uh, enough variety of monsters. Even though it is not very easy for an urban setting, I, can, I think we can handle it. I think we will be able to uh, integrate a lot of variety in the monsters area as well, in a sense. Taking that into account, oh, one particular thing I've seen people say is tricky to do in more urban style campaigns is how to do is how to handle a dungeon crawl. Um, in your in your guys' experience, since you since you've got plenty of experience with doing or with doing urban or city or city state style campaigns. How would one integrate a the aesthetic of a of a dungeon crawl into that, and how was that done with um, with blood punk? Oh, actually, uh, dungeon uh, the dungeons are the first things that we designed, and uh, we moved on from there. The first dungeon uh, we have ever designed was the uh, for this project, uh, the metro line. So uh, the boat the boat cities are connected uh, with a railway. And uh, this uh, way crosses the mountain tunnels, and inside the tunnels uh, there is a metro line, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's like a labyrinth, and it constantly reshapes, it moves. Uh, so, in the second chapter of the adventure, we have a moving and uh, ever-changing dungeon, mm -hmm. and uh, adventurers uh, players uh, might uh, use. Wagons, uh, metro trains, uh, or uh, small tunnels, short paths, uh, and even walk from uh, railways uh, to delve this dungeon. Mm -hmm. but, but we are designing dungeons for Conrad and uh, Searstead, the Sorcerer City as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the most magnificent dungeon crawl uh, for this time, it will be the subway systems, uh, STV mentioned. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are inspired on making a very weird, interesting dungeon crawl in Searstead as well, because that is a sorcerer city, sorcerer based city, where you can make a lot of weird things in such a city. And it is Art Deco style, so we can have some uh, Bioshock vibes in there. And in Karat, it is a classical Victorian age city, so we can delve into the underground or something mm -hmm. in Karat as well. Yeah. Now, I'd like to pivot for a bit to talk about the player-facing aspects. First, starting with um, the Crimson race template. Now, is it... What would what would separate a what would separate a crimson from the from the typical vampire? Well, well a crimson template is not about vampires. It's uh, actually uh, its source is unknown. It's uh, it's something that happens, but no one knows why. Uh, when uh, a ba baby born, uh, and there uh, there will seen uh, some. Uh, omens, I think, uh, like uh, when the mother dies in uh, wild birth or something bad happens related to blood while the baby is born, uh, then the baby uh, might have the crimson template, but nobody knows why and nobody knows how. So like uh, we said before, uh, not everything uh, is about vampires or sorcerers. Uh, there are uh, content about uh, purely about blood, uh, and their origin is uh, largely unknown to players. Mm -hmm. So, with so it would be it would be a case where the, where 
the, where it's just it's some it's is that the reason why you guys went with a template instead of a full on race with this concept? Yeah, we wanted the players to experience uh, adventure uh, with whichever race they want. Uh, so we want to offer a template rather than a race. Mm -hmm. So now that brings me to the Sanguine domain for clerics, which obviously I can infer a few things just from the name alone, but what sort of what sort of direction would a would a sanguine cleric have in terms of what it's able to bring to the table? Um, I can say that when we were designing Bloodpunk, we didn't want to go to the uh, I forgot the religion name for it, but we didn't want it to be like many gods and goddesses everywhere. We wanted to keep it simple, and there are one or perhaps two deities in uh, Bloodpunk. And the most important deity is, of course, the god of blood. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not like the Warhammer deity Korn. It is not like that. But uh, as this is Bloodpunk, they worship to god of blood as the bringer of progress, bringer of vampires, bringer of everything. Mm -hmm. So Sanguine Domain is a direct devotee to that god, actually. And what it does is, um, it uses blood to... The Sanguine Domain cleric does not have to be a vampire. It is not related to vampires. The cleric uh, themselves can uh, have powers that uh, bring blessings to their allies and curses to their enemies through the blood itself. They can also summon uh, blood creatures and they can also mark people through their blood, etc. So, we instead of from the game design perspective, we approach Sanguine Domain from the lore perspective because we said that if there's this De deity who rules all blood, there should be a domain that is directly, directly linked to that. And hence, the Sanguine Domain appeared. Uh, the designer of Sanguine Domain in terms of game mechanics was Avijan, so I wish he was here, but he had a work to do. And at the last minute, he had to go there. Mm -hmm. So sadly, we won't be able to give more details in that, but in, in short, it's what I said. In game design terms, it is able to buff, debuff, or create uh, buff and debuff through blood and create uh, blood creatures. Mm -hmm. and and also, yeah, please yeah. go to you. About the clerics uh, of Tolia, uh, there is this thing that uh, in a normal Dungeons & Dragons game, you can be sure, you can be certain of the existence of some deities. You can travel to heavens, to hell, to abyss, to various realms and you can talk with deities, you can commune with them, you can see some of them even, uh, but uh, it's not the case uh, in this setting. Uh, so nobody actually knows if there is a deity or uh, if there is a if there is one deity or more. Uh, they just uh, perceive things as holy, as Sun Queen domains uh, perceive blood as holy, and they just go from there. They uh, worship a deity, uh, they say that it's a blood deity, mm -hmm. but uh, no one can be sure. They can just believe. It's like the real world, in that sense. Yeah. Now, next of, co next of course would be the bounty hunter for rogues, which there's been no shortage of interpretations of the concept of a bounty hunter, so I'm curious what, um, how it would be setting specific in, in terms of bounty hunter's role in the world of Tolia. Well, uh, bounty hunter. The name bounty hunter was actually not the beginning part of that uh, rogue archetype. Uh, I wanted to design a rogue that was very good with bloodwork weapons and able to use traps and etc. Interesting things to uh, be best their enemies. And with all those tools at hand, the rogue archetype felt like the bounty, 
it could be a bounty hunter and hence it is a rogue ar archetype I thought using those tools would work best as a bounty hunter mm -hmm. and that's why I gave the name bounty hunter but I didn't move from the name to the archetype but rather from the archetype to the name while I was designing it but the thing I wanted was I wanted to make a, an archetype that was able to make full use of all the tools and technology we are presenting in this setting. Mm -hmm. So, now with that, with that, in well, I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe I also forgot about the um, blood guard when it comes to paladins. Um, and. I'm guess I'm guessing given what you mentioned about a deity of blood for pet for cl for clerics um you have a sim you have a similar kind of attitude regarding regarding the regarding deity relationships with paladins regarding the blood guard So the thing about blood guards are uh, they uh, they value blood. That the, everyone in this setting values blood. It is used for uh, spells in machines and uh, actually in economy, uh, but uh, blood guards uh, bring it to a whole new level, and they uh, see it is so valuable that it shouldn't be spilled. Mm -hmm. uh, in some sense, uh, they see it is uh, as it is holy thing. It's a uh, essence of life, and uh, they protect the blood of their allies, their, their own. Uh, they. They don't want it to be spilled, to be wasted. Uh, mm -hmm. So they uh, try to protect. For them, blood is sacred, uh, and it's a divine entity of itself. Yep. And in terms of their enemies, they are like they see those blood of their enemies because of uh, ideological enemies, not like oh, you are my enemy, then. Uh, damn you kind of it's not like that but if they believe a certain creature or a faction etc is to be enemy they see their blood as being wasted because they that blood is put on bad use according to them so while they are trying to protect their allies blood because that's valuable they are trying to take back their enemies blood so that they can put that blood to better use rather than be that is be, being wasted on Virtuous people, mm -hmm. sort of thing. And all blood guards have a different interpretation of blood. Uh, they might worship deities of good or evil. It doesn't matter. Uh, all that matters for them uh, is the value of blood. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the blood elementalist for the sorcerer. And I'm yeah, cu I I'm curious what I'm curious um, what their particular playstyle would add to the sorcerer class. So I can uh, easily talk about that because I designed the <laughs> sorcerer. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the sorcerer city uh, was built uh, by four prime sorcerers, and uh, there are three sorcerer archetypes we are offering uh, for each prime sorcerer, uh, but the fourth one. Uh, is a little bit different, a little bit of philosophical uh, approach to blood, so we didn't uh, give it as an archetype. Uh, the thing about uh, these sorcerers are uh, they uh, they made researches about blood and alchemical researches, mm -hmm. uh, and they say that there are uh, aspects of blood, uh, uh, there are parts. Uh, fundamental parts uh, that can come together, comes together and create blood. And each uh, sorcerer archetype uh, uses different uh, components of that. And uh, some uh, might co directly control the flow of blood and some uh, might use uh, blood to uh, control the vessels uh, it flows in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the blood elementalist, uh, it uh, uses blood uh, as a weapon, it uses the blood uh, as a projectile, uh, um, like a blood bender, I guess. I I can get I can get behind that I can get behind that just with a a whole lot more of 
offensively using it and a whole lot less of controlling bodies. I'm guessing. Oh, oh they uh, use it uh, offensively, like uh, throwing a blood orb and, you know, uh, drawing their enemies' blood and uh, draining their bodies kind of thing. Yeah. Now, when it... Now, one of the th one of the things that's mentioned quite a bit as key to to the to this society to the society within the mega cities and just this blood based technology within the setting is what's referred to as angst crystals. I'd like to go into a bit of detail onto what the what those kind of things entail. So the reason we called uh, it uh, angst crystals uh, is uh, because of the history of the setting. Uh, at some point in Tolia, uh, nobility, uh, before Conrad and Seerstedt, the nobility uses these crystals uh, to make uh, jewelry and uh, ornaments. So uh, they uh, wear the crystal. Uh, they make rings, they make necklaces. Uh, but the thing about angst is uh, it interacts with blood. So uh, when someone uh, wears a jewelry made from angst, uh, it makes them anxious as it uh, tries to draw the blood uh, in the body and it uh, radiates heat. So it makes people anxious to wear uh, angst jewelry and hence the name angst crystals. Now, I know there's obviously going to be plenty of plenty of weapons and items that utilize this te this tech. I'm cu I'm curious if there's any sort of keyword, any sort of rule to a to a firearm or the like that would utilize it, or if it would just work like a normal firearm, just with a different kind of ammo. Oh yeah. Um, so we have two types of new weapons. Uh, one of them is angst weapons. Uh, STV and our friend Emre designed them. Mm -hmm. uh, it works by... Actually, STV can uh, describe it in more detail, but first let me describe the bloodwork weapons. So the firearms of this realm is the bloodwork weapons. It is a firearm in that sense. It is shooting lead bullets. Mm -hmm. Or it is exploding and spreading sharpness or spreading gas like a grenade. Uh, the key point that differentiates the firearm from a regular firearm is that blood work weapons from a regular firearm is that it uses a very rapid uh, combustion mm -hmm. by uh, spreading blood from a vial uh, from a canister to the angst in a very short amount of time. So it creates uh, this combustion. Mm -hmm. uh, this short time and this uh, pressure creates a short combustion and thus it shoots the projectile like a firearm. Mm -hmm. So the blood work weapons work this way, but angst weapons are a little bit different. Please continue, Sede. Oh, they are a bit uh, like uh, magical weapons mm -hmm. in that sense, but uh, most are not uh, magical. It's, uh, it's uh, like uh, a semi-magical technology. Uh, it draws blood and it radiates heat and light uh, and makes the weapon work. It's like a, a sword that's imbued with uh, angst veins uh, in the blade. So it draws blood, the uh, angst veins heat, and the blade heats, and it deals fire damage kind of thing. And in the mechanics terms, it's like uh, the, more you, the more blood you draw, the better the weapon becomes, in a sense, in terms of angst weapons. Yeah, but and also uh, the, some weapons uh, might need uh, an alchemically enhanced uh, blood, like uh, blood work weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, uh, just uh, getting a blood from creature and uh, putting it in the canister uh, won't work. So it's a special kind of progress. Oh, something something that would requ that um. Would require the refinement that you'd need. You'd need, say, an alchemist to do. Uh, yes, and that's why uh, in Conrad there are lots of refineries and uh, alchemical workshops. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I had I had seen that that um 
due to it be due to it having Victorian level tech, you're starting to see the at the advent of more and more firearms. Um, even with even with that, I'm guessing that you guys are go are going to links to make sure that in this setting, firearms don't out don't outshine melee weapons. Both have their use. That is true. Um, they all have their uses. Um, the actually the bloodwork weapons are kind of like crossbows, but they have a different uh, technique to use. Like uh, they are slower to reload, mm -hmm. but you can shoot multiple projectiles. So you have to you shoot one turn and shoot another turn and shoot another turn and then when your ammo is depleted on the magazine mm -hmm. or rather in the revolver, then you uh, load it again and loading it uh, takes longer than uh, that of a crossbow and you cannot take a feat like a uh, rapid reload like you do in crossbows. You cannot do that in blood work weapons. So uh, it they hit harder than crossbows, mm -hmm. but it takes longer to it's more of a tactical decision to shoot and load than, than crossbows, I would say. But in terms of melee weapons, uh, they don't outshine melee weapons, I can say, because in the D&D, in general, what I see is melee weapons are always the king rather than the range weapons. So, yeah, they still cannot outshine uh, melee weapons. And also, even if they try to, then there is these angst weapons that you are using up. Uh, Swap with full angst veins, so in that sense, that balances itself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. All, I'm. All, I'm always on the lookout to make sure that one one angle doesn't become too useful, in a sense. Yeah, uh, if we, if 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 people try to integrate these technologies to a random realm, for for example, I don't know, forgotten realms. Mm -hmm. Then it may create imbalances. I suspect. I I don't know. I'm not sure. But within the realm itself, uh, uh, it's completely balanced and applicable. Yeah. Well, because of the uh, simple rules, basics of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I think it wouldn't uh, differ much because uh, it has low damage, or like a regular damage, like a crossbow, uh, and it deals. Uh, a 2d6 or 3d6 I guess mm -hmm. and uh, even though it uh, shoots projectiles and in real life it would kill someone with a single shot in Dungeons and Dragons terms uh, characters and players usually have lots of lots of hit points and it wouldn't bother them yeah. now I'd like to address the uh, the other half of the equation with with this um, the module that you guys are adding called Heritage of the Dam, which, as I understand it, it runs from first to seventh level. Uh, yes, it does. It's a short adventure. I don't know. You are telling the Heritage of the Dam or the other uh, short adventure? Mm -hmm. Well, the Heritage of the Dam. Mm -hmm. uh, it was first to seventh level adventure. Then it became a first. 11th level adventure with the stretch goals. Yeah, and we are we are kind of looking positive that we will pass that stretch goal. So yeah, it will be a one to eleven levels. Yeah. Now, what sort of tone is Heritage of the Damned going to have as far as far as that it as far as the way the adventure goes? So at the start of the adventure, we already shared uh, the beginning. Uh, the players will be oppressed severely. Uh, they will hate the city. They will hate the bureaucracy. Uh, they <laughs> they will just hate the vampires. Everything related to the city. And it's a, at some point uh, they need to uh, work with those things that hate uh, to survive. And uh, through the adventure. They mostly try to survive and overcome challenges while doing it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the sit that it primarily takes pl that a lot of the events within it are going to primarily take place within the city, um, not so much outside, not so much outside of it. So there are three parts to adventure. Uh, at first part, uh, it will be in Conrad. The characters will uh, explore the vampire city. 
uh, in the second part, uh, they will travel from Conrad to Searstead and they will explore the uh, train line, uh, the railroad and the mountains. And if uh, they want, they could uh, explore the wilderness around the cities. And in the third part, uh, they will be in Searstead and uh, they will explore the Sorcerer City. Mm-hmm. Now, since we have two mega cities here, um, Karnath and Sirested, um, what could you tell me about the about the differences between the way the two cities present themselves? The most important difference is in the styles of them. As we mentioned, one city is more like Victorian age, uh, Victorian kind of style. Mm-hmm. The other one is more like Art Deco style. The Sorcerer City, Searstead, is more Art Deco. So, uh, in in terms of other games, I can give ex- examples. Uh, Searstead is more like Bioshock, in that sense. Mm-hmm. More Art Deco. And more like the Arcane, the miniseries Arcane can also be an example to Searstead, I guess. Yeah. You know, about the League of Legends, the, mm-hmm. that miniseries. Oh, yeah. And for Conrad, it is the usual steampunk, uh, Victorian, uh, Dracula, and I cannot say Bloodborne because I didn't play it, but uh, what can I say? Um, Dishonored? This, well, yes, yeah, kind of Dishonored, but Dishonored is also in the middle, I guess. But yeah, kind of Dishonored, mm-hmm. kind of a uh, place the Conrad is. So Conrad is more like uh, those times England and Searstead is more like those times U.S., I would say, perhaps. Yeah, and the main vibes of the city are that uh, Conrad is a mostly terrifying city, uh, but uh, Searstead is mostly an intimidating city. In Conrad, uh, anything could happen to you in a back street, in a back alley, uh, but in uh, Searstead, uh, authority, uh, the organizations, the enforcer force, the police are more intimidating uh, and it's a bit, it's a more oppressing, openly oppressing. Mm-hmm. I can, I can certainly get that. Now, what are you, sh- what are you guys shooting for as far as the page count for both books? I know that this might change due to stretch goals, but what, but what would be the ballpark? Well, first of all, we are never good at reaching, uh, never good at uh, committing to our page numbers. In that sense, we always somehow end up having more pages in our book than what we initially planned. So the numbers I will give now will change, may change. But we thought as 200 pages each, 200 pages for the adventure and 200 pages for the region guide the campaign setting Mm -hmm. but then with the expansion the adventure expansion to 11th level uh, i think the adventure will be 250 pages planned it may go towards 300 and the campaign setting is 200 pages planned but it may go towards 250 Mm -hmm. and i i will i will certainly i will certainly keep an eye out um, for that but with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and once again braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up here to here to my temple to enjoy the madness at play here. It's our pleasure and it's very nice to talk with you again. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Uh, I forgot to drink again. Okay, next time we are doing this, uh, you know, conversation, I will. I promise you, I will have a drink. <laughs> Whiskey, pro- most probably. <laughs> of course. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!